It isn't every day that you get to solve a hundred year old mystery. Before I found this maker's plate, the wreck was just one of the many hundreds, maybe thousands of unknown ships that lie on the seabed off the English coast. We're now able to say that it is definitely the SS Lucent, sunk in 1917 by the German submarine UC-66. As well as finding the maker's plate, you're going to see other stuff in this video, such as capturing this tasty lobster. Uh -huh. Surface conditions weren't the greatest for the dive, but it was a wreck none of us on the boat had done before, so you're always pleased to get in the water. Myself and my buddy were the second pair in, which meant we got the task of taking the lazy shot. That's the rope I've got in my hand. As soon as I got in the water though, I could look down and see that the visibility was excellent. That's always a good start to any dive. First thing I need to do is get the lazy shot clipped onto the main shot. That's the thing in front of me with the boy on and you can see I'm swimming along to it. I'm also starting my descent. No reason to hang around the surface. I just need to intercept that rope at some point and that's what I'm going to do. My buddy's already on the way down. He's standing by ready to help me though if I need the assistance. But it's a fairly straightforward task and something I've done many times before. You can see I'm getting deeper. Not only is the depth increasing on the right hand side but the water's changing colour really rapidly going from that lovely blue at the surface down to a much more gloopy green. Here I am about 15 metres. I've got the lazy shot on and I'm dropping it down the main shot line. I'm actually using the weight of it to pull me down as well. No point in hanging around on a dive like this. You just want to get down and get everything set up. As I'm heading down, I'll just tell you a bit more about the SS Lucent. It was built in 1879 in Sunderland, as were a vast number of ships at the time. Approximately 1,400 tonnes, 76 metres long and 10 metres wide. So many ships of this era were the similar sort of size. It was built to move coal around so it wasn't a particularly special ship in any way, shape or form. Perhaps the most interesting thing about it was the way it was sunk. Everyone expects ships sunk by submarines to be torpedoed. But in the First World War this was surprisingly uncommon. The skippers liked to save torpedoes which were expensive and also unreliable. So often they'd come alongside ships, get the crews off and then either sink them using gunfire or by placing charges on board them. In this case, the Lucent was sunk by gunfire and there were no casualties. The lazy shot is only about 40 metres long, so I'm getting to the point where I'm going to run out of rope. This is just happening. So as you can see, I'm going to take the prussic loop off one of the clips. I'm then going to wrap the prussic loop around the main shot and reattach the lazy shot using the prosec. This means that the lazy shot will stay at the depth where the prosec has been attached to the main shot. It won't ride up due to either divers pulling in on it or the current picking up. Getting this set up is an important job. We're going to spend an awful lot of time next to the lazy shot once we've completed our dive. I've no idea why they've given it to me then. The snap shackle is designed so that it can be released under tension. That might become important once again if there's lots of divers hanging on the lazy shot and the current has picked up significantly. If that doesn't work, an absolute push comes to the shove, the last pair can always chop the prosec, which isn't expensive and nobody's going to get care if it gets lost. That's all set up now, so carrying on the descent. And you can see there, the strobes from the first pair of divers are clearly visible below us. That's another good sign. It means the visibility is really good. I've just had a quick look up there, wondering where my buddy is, but actually he's there just alongside me. He's diving a Liberty rebreather, which is why it's got that nice little flashing bulb on the top of it. Makes it really easy to see him. Now getting closer to the bottom, I've turned on my main torch. I can see the strobes. And I've just got my own strobes out ready to go. I'm going to attach them about a similar point.
you can actually see there's so much ambient light down here on this dive you can actually start to make out the wreck without even needing a torch that's really good news at 70 meters you normally expect it to be pretty dark and not able to see anything without a torch one of the great things about visibility like this is it makes it really easy to orientate yourself on the wreck I can see directly underneath me there that is the drive shaft so I'm in the stern of the boat almost certainly the engine is either to my right or my left I have to make a decision trying to figure out which way to the center of the boat to the engine as it turns out I guess correctly and go right Underwater visibility is great, although the wreck's really broken. Not surprising when you consider it's been underwater for over a hundred years. This part of the sea has very little protection from the prevailing winds which are westerly, so it will also have been battered by storms every winter for those hundred years. I'm coming on to the top of the wreck now. You can see the uh, engine drive shaft and then the actual engine itself. There's loads of net but also loads of fish. It's actually a really nice little wreck and I'm really enjoying the dive at this point. Anytime you're around the engine it's always worth having a good look around. There's all sorts of interesting things. That brass circle, although I don't think it's anything particularly notable. And I'm just swimming around the wreck, having a quick look round, seeing if there's anything catches my eye. Most steel and iron on a wreck is furry from the corrosion. So anything that's got straight edges is worth a look. This below me, this plate, is clearly not steel or iron. Almost certainly non-ferrous, so bronze or brass. I decide to get it out and have a look at it. It's kind of stuck in there, so it's difficult to get out. I can also see that it appears to have been worked. So it's probably a piece of material that was used for doing repairs on the engine or perhaps other parts of the ship. Still, interesting to see. Anyway, I'll leave it and move on. Then I spot something else, just there, under a bit of girder, under a few bricks. It's also got straight edges, although unlike the other one, it doesn't appear to have been clipped. I'm going to pull it out and have a look at it. Like all these wrecks, there's loads of silt. As soon as you move anything, it all kicks up. But I then get it out, and this is much more interesting. What's interesting about it? is it's a nice regular shape. It's also got those two studs on the front and on the back. Almost certainly it's been mounted on something. This looks as though it's important. I'm going to have a look and see if I can see anything on it. I get my knife out and scrape off. I'm hoping that it will reveal some letters. Although I don't know why I'm doing it on what's clearly the bit that was facing the wall. In a moment I turn it over and have a look on the other side. There we go. I'm looking to see if there's any markings, if I can see any writing, uh, anything. Once again, I scratch again, hoping that it's going to reveal something. Even with a bright torch like that, it's surprisingly difficult to pick things out underwater, and I can't see anything. Even though I feel intuitively that it's got to be something important because of the fact it's been attached to something, 
I can't see any, any writing on it, which is what I'm expecting to see. This makes me believe that maybe it isn't what I think it is, even though I do feel that this is probably a maker's plate. You can hear me talking through my rebreather at my buddy, trying to maybe get his opinion. I'm not getting any feedback, so I carry on scraping, hoping that will reveal something. But it doesn't, unfortunately. It's quite frustrating. I'd love to see something really obvious at this point. But I know that it's difficult to see things underwater quite often. So I decide I'm going to stick it in my bag, bring it up to the surface, and then have a look when we get up there. Obviously, there's always the danger that you pick something up, you bring it up, it turns out to be nothing, and then you've just got to handle having uh, the mickey taken out of you all the way back. Fortunately for me, this one turns out to be a really, really good decision. About the only bad bit is that this is quite early on in the dive, so I'm going to have to carry on with this bag, carrying it the whole time for the rest of the dive. But hey, it's a small price to pay. I'm now swimming forward, up past the bridge and into what must have been the forward cargo hold. It's absolutely full of stuff. When it sunk, the Lucent was caught carrying government stores. And then there's these things. There's a load of them. I've no idea what they are. Perhaps some sort of tyres, maybe, or wheels. It's difficult to say what they're made of. I'm really close to the bow now, and any time you're near the bow, you've always got to look out for the bell, especially if you don't think it's come off a wreck. So when I spot this, I get quite excited. Unfortunately, as soon as I touch it, I realise it isn't the bell. But more out of hope than anything else, I just give it a bit of a fan to see if I can see any more about it. It's far too thin to be a bell though. So uh, I quickly move on.
that's the capstan for raising and lowering the anchors there's also various other bits of chain and other sort of paraphernalia that you associate with a bow it's all around here I'm heading back towards the bridge now so this is the forward cargo hold once again you can see that by all these big wheels or tires or whatever they are You might be wondering what's going on here with my glove. It doesn't come out particularly well on the video, but I've actually torn a hole in the dry glove so it's flooding. To stop the water going up my sleeve, I've got to remove the small piece of tubing on the inner seal that allows the gas inside my dry glove to uh, equalise. Then something else catches my eye. It's really quite distinctive. That's clearly the boss of a helm. So I've got to go over and have a look at that. It takes me a while to figure out what's going on here. But the helm is actually that big iron thing in front of me. So often these are brass on ships. But this is a relatively cheaply made ship. So they've used an iron one in this case. I'm going to remove as much of the uh, netting as I possibly can to get a better look at it. Unfortunately, all that does is confirm what I thought.
Still, a helm's not something you see every day. So I'll try and let the other divers know it's here. So they can come over and have a look. And I then use the universal symbol for... This is a helm. I'm not sure that's anything many diving agencies teach you. But it seems to work okay. I'm just to the port side of the bridge now. That looks like a valve that somebody's dug out and left there for other people to have a look at them. You can tell this wreck hasn't been dived very much. That lobster doesn't seem to know that divers are bad for him. Almost inviting me to come and grab him. Which, obviously, I do. As I quite like lobster. For those who've never grabbed a lobster, this is the recommended technique. Get them behind the head where they can't reach you with the claws. Grab them anywhere else and you're going to get a really nasty nip. It's also useful to have a buddy, particularly one with a goodie bag. Mine's actually got a maker's plate in it at the moment. So I'm going to need another one and we're going to work as a team to get this lobster into the bag. Already this is proving to be an excellent day for me. A maker's plate and a lobster. It is actually my birthday, so that seems wholly appropriate. Too late the lobster realises that we don't mean him any good. He's proving quite troublesome to get in that bag. Neither of us is very keen to get nipped, so we're both being very cautious.
on a wreck this size I'd expect there to have been more portholes. This is the only one that I see on the dive. I pull it out and put it where people can see it. All too soon, bottom time is nearly up. I'm just heading back along the drive shaft now, heading towards the shot. I don't always dive with a buddy on technical dives, but when I do, it's great to have someone around. We both know the dive's done, and time to go up. Bit of admin first, got to take off your strobes, and actually, all of a sudden it seems as though the sea is alive with divers. Seems everyone else has turned up back at the shot at the same time. As always, I don't hang round on a sense. Once I've made the decision that it's time to come up, I'm going to get up as quickly as I can. Next thing to do is to remove my tag. This is a lazy shot that we put in earlier and you can see it's under quite a bit of strain. Almost certainly the tide has picked up a bit on the surface and that's what's pulling it. As I look down I can see almost every other diver on the boat. It's really unusual to get this many people together at the lazy shot at the same time. I guess it's just one of those things you do enough diving, it's bound to happen eventually. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed following me through my dive. For me, it's been a cracker. Underwater visibility is awesome, and I've had two great results. Not only have I got a maker's plate, but I've got a nice, lovely lobster to have for my dinner as well. If you've enjoyed this video, I'd love to hear from you in the comments section. It'd also be great if you could like it, share it with other like-minded souls, and of course, it's always great news when somebody decides they want to subscribe to my channel.